Thank you for coming this afternoon. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Dale Dance from Virginia Commonwealth University. She's published extensively in the area of black American humor and has recently written a book concerning um, black folklore in America. This afternoon, she'll address the topic of Afro-American humor. Dr. Dance. As we consider the humor of different cultural, national, regional, racial, and sexual groups, as well as the humor from various media, the one thing that stands out above our every effort to categorize is the commonality each and every group and every form of media shares. The function of the humor, the motivational factors of the humor, the goals of the humor, the psychological implications of the humor, the types of humorous characters, the devices used to achieve humor, the varied genres in which the humor is expressed, and the subjects and motifs of the tales, jokes, and anecdotes all serve to remind us of how much we have in common. And even though obvious variations occur as material is adopted by particular groups and media, so that a specific item in its expression may obviously be classified as Negro humor, Jewish humor, woman's humor, TV humor, magazine humor, etc. That item will have a familiarity for many other groups who share certain aspects of it. Certainly what we laugh at and why we laugh serves to remind us more of our basic kinship than our differences. This is the disturbing conclusion that I kept reaching as I attempted to prepare this presentation. Disturbing because I had to prepare a paper specifically on Afro-American humor. First, I considered treating the function of the black man's humor in this country, noting that it has been largely compensatory. Laughter has always been for him a way of making life possible in a cruel world where he has been seen variously as a role, a problem, a victim, a child, a heathen, a clown, a chattel, but rarely as a person, a man. Laughter has been a way of protesting against his situation in America, striking out against his oppressor and relieving repressions, expressing his aggressions, and occasionally, hopefully, educating and correcting. But, yet, but immediately I recognized this use of humor to criticize the foibles and inadequacies of society, to attack the enemy, to release aggressive drives, to sway opinion, is not, of course, original with or unique to the Negro, having been important factors of humor for all ages. Then I considered treating the comic types in black American humor. I could discuss the prejudiced white boss, the representative of the white racist establishment who is so prominent in black humor. He's old massa during slavery. Later he becomes Mr. Charlie, and more recently merely honky or whitey. I could treat the later developing comic character, the liberal white, sometimes referred to as the Negrotarian. And <laughs> those Negrotarians might be divided into two classes. Hadn't heard that term before? <laughs> ah, this became popular in the 20s. Um, uh, and the Negrotarians are divided into two classes, those who are professional uplifters, determined to raise up the darker brothers, and those who are not so much concerned about uplift as enjoying the exoticism of the Negro. <laughs> then I could consider the popular Negro types, the dicti, including the Niggerati, the Uncle Tom, the Dr. Thomas, the minister, the old sister, the big mama, the topsy type, and finally the trickster and the bad nigger who have their origins in the popular Br rabbit and slave John and who find expression in various characters such as John Henry, the signifying monkey, Shine, and Stagger Lee. And while I could note many distinctive aspects of these characters, I kept coming to the disturbing realization that they have their parallels in white humor as well. As a matter of fact, John Henry is claimed by whites. Moreover, 
It has always been a convention of comedy to ridicule and expose hypocrisy and pretentiousness and to expose and ridicule fools. The hypocritical, pretentious priests, parsons, ministers, leaders, etc., have been a favorite subject of jest in all groups. Many an American Negro preacher in jokes finds a medieval counterpart in Chaucer's partner. The trickster who must rely on his guile and cunning to compete with stronger men certainly goes back to Odysseus. The anti-hero has a long heritage among other cultures as well. The use of animals such as Barabbas to satirize the behavior of men has a long and venerable tradition. Next, I consider discussing the forms in which black humor is, is expressed. Discussing the tales, including the tall tales, the jokes, the anecdotes, the dirty dozens, the toast, and the songs. But even the most distinctive of these forms share certain characteristic with characteristics with forms in other cultures. And even the most distinctive of these forms are now being found among American whites. When I first began doing this research in 1970, a very good friend of mine who was an excellent storyteller uh, was, had consented to an interview with me. And we were talking about the friendly banter so common among Negroes, comparable to the dozens. And he noted, uh, and I quote him directly, white folks are strange. They ain't like that. They don't even insult each other. <laughs> uh, my friend, were he alive today, would be pleased or perhaps disturbed to learn that white folks are getting more and more like that. As a matter of fact, in recent years, even the toast have been collected uh, from white informants. Well, what to talk about then? Even though I have been oversimplifying the issue, and I think I could have developed either of those areas I mentioned, citing sufficient evidence of rather peculiarly American, black American characteristics in either of them, I did conclude that there were two main characteristics of black humor that I considered distinctive enough to emphasize today. First, there is the uniqueness of the black American situation and history and the black man's reaction to his experiences, which make up the subject matter of much of his humor. And second, there is the matter of style. First, the black experience. No other group has, except in isolated instances, suffered the middle passage, experienced the humiliations of the slave block as it existed in America, mm -hmm. been legally declared a fraction of a human being, been disenfranchised, been denied access to public water fountains, bathrooms, restaurants, etc., been the victim of laws and social customs that had the power of legal prescription, regulating where he could eat, sleep, sit, ride, walk, go to school, worship, and work, and whom he could marry. No other group has been so consistently the victim of such gross miscarriage of justice in a country dedicated to the rights of the individual. No other group has so consistently viewed American democracy and Christianity at work from the whole of the ship, the back of the bus, the balcony of the theater and church, and the wrong side of the tracks, not to mention occasionally from the lynching mob's noose. An irony of ironies, at the same time that he has suffered all of these ills, the black man has heard the dominant American society insist not only was he happy and contented, but also that he was the recipient of its favors. The ludicrousness of this situation has furnished the subject matter for much black American humor. The old folk tale of the fox and the goose is a representative commentary on the failure of Americans to live up to the, to the standards of their idealistic documents and laws promising freedom and protection to all. In this tale, Fox shrewdly attempts to make Goose relax her caution by telling her that the animals have passed a law that no beast will harm any other creature. But then Dog comes along <clears throat> and Fox flees. When Goose facetiously reminds him that he should not fear Dog considering the new law, Fox replies as he runs off, yes, the animals passed the law, but some of the animals around here ain't got much respect for the law. More humorous, ironic jokes on the promise of democracy arose following the world wars. One tells of the Negro soldier being harassed by a group of whites on a bus who faced his white tormentors and countered, well, if I'm going to die for democracy, I might as well die for some of it down here in Georgia. Another similarly gruesome tale concerns an epitaph. Here lies a black man killed by a yellow man 
while fighting to save democracy for the white man. More recently, Dick Gregory has commented on the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson neglected to label it for whites only. The cynical view of events in this country from the black perspective were often captured by W.E.B. Du Bois in his column as the crow flies. And many people are not aware of Du Bois' great sense of humor sometimes. Um, he writes, Mr. Roosevelt's record on the Negro problem is clear. He hasn't any. <laughs> Again, he writes, Mr. Hoover's record on the Negro problem is not clear. And in that respect, it resembles his record on everything else. <laughs> Again, even more bitter bitterly, he notes, nothing has filled us with such unholy glee as Hitler and the Nordics. When the only inferior people were niggers, it was hard to get the attention of the New York Times for little matters of race, lynching, and mobs. But now that the damned include the owner of the Times, moral indignation is perking up. Again, he writes, Georgia is adopting a 10 years plan for social uplift. It includes only five lynchings a year. And finally, though this one is not the least bit relevant, I could not uh, resist the temptation to include it. Uh, it's not relevant to my talk, but it seems so timely. Du Bois in 1931 wrote in one essay in As the Crow's Crow Flies, Chicago has paid its gangsters, but still owes its teachers. <laughs> 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 the white man's arrogation of the best of everything for himself has been lampooned in much black humor, such as these two tales. A Klansman said, Hey, nigger, what town is this? John say, Miami, Captain, Miami. He hit John and knocked him flat. Now get up and tell me what town this is. John said, Miami, boss, Miami. He knocked him down again. This happened four times. He said, now nigger, what town is this? John say, yo ammy, boss, yo ammy. <laughs> A nigger was on the street in Alabama singing, it's Molly and me and baby makes three, happy in my blue heaven. A white man walked up and hit him on the head and knocked him down. Now get up and sing that song like a black SOB supposed to sing it. When his head cleared, the Negro got up, shook his head, and sang, It's the mistress and y'all, no niggers at all, happy in y'all's blue heaven. Custom has required that the Negro regard the white woman with a special awe, since experience has taught him that severe punishment often awaits him if he even looks at her in a questionable manner. Several jokes and sayings have evolved from this subject. One of, my comment, one of my informants commented during a conversation, my luck was so bad I must have slapped a white woman, suggesting, <laughs> suggesting that this is the sin for which one might expect the most severe punishment. Several tales have evolved on this subject. This tall tale from Sterling's Laughing on the Outside seems less ridiculous when one reviews actual cases of incidents involving black men and white women in the South. Jim and his partner Bill were working on this high building. Jim got too close to the edge, and Bill called out, Jim, stop, you're about to fall off. As he went over, Jim hollered, I can't stop, I'm on my way. Bill leaned over the edge of the building and said, Jim, stop, else you're gonna fall right on that white lady below. So Jim stopped and came right on up again. <laughs> In the Negro's humor, the idea of white supremacy is often ludicrously applied to anything that is black and white. Thus we have such jokes as the following. A black hen laid a white egg and they hung her. Governor Faubus is going to divorce his wife because he caught her looking at colored TV last night. <laughs> Much humor from slavery to the present presents the white man as a hard and exacting taskmaster master, who forces the Negro to work hard and cheats him out of his just rewards. The slaves sang, we raise the wheat, they give us the corn. We bake the bread, they give us the crust. We sift the meal, they give us the hus. We peel the meat, they give us the skin, and that's the way they takes us in. We skim the pot, they give us the liquor, and say that's good enough for a nigger. Zora Neale Hurston collected a tale about a straw boss in middle Georgia who was so mean that when the boiler bust 
and blowed some of the men up in the air. He docked them for the time they was off the job. <laughs> Many of the jokes deal with the general cruelty and inhumanity of the white man who is frequently pictured as a devil who makes the Negro's life hell. Although recently there have arisen jokes on the white liberal, the white devil in black folklore remains the cruel, slave-driving, racist white southerner, the harsh slave master, the unfeeling white boss, the inhuman Ku Kluxa, the brutal, sadistic white sheriff, the unjust white judge, and the ordinary all-American white Christian who visits all manner of persecution on his black brother, like those good Christians in George Schuyler's Black No More. In that novel, um, uh, a formula is discovered to turn black whites, turn blacks white, so that most Negroes disappear uh, from the United States. Practically everybody is white. And in um, this particular scene, we find a group of uh, Christians who are very sad because they have no Negroes to lynch. Their minister, Reverend McFuel, has been praying to the Lord to send him a nigger for his congregation to lynch. Two hapless Negroes, quotation marks, because they simply appear as Negroes, but the crowd assumes they are, appear and are immediately seized by the people. Shiloh writes, but for the calmness and presence of mind of the Reverend McFuel, the true faith Christ lovers would have torn the unfortunate men limb from limb the evangelists restrained the more hot-headed individuals and insisted that the ceremonies proceed according to time-honored custom. So the impetuous yielded to wiser counsel. The two men, vociferously protesting, were stripped naked, held down by husky and willing farm hands, and their ears and genitals cut off with jackknives amid the fiendish cry of men and women. The two victims were then sh chased, shot, and burned at stake. The crowd whooped with glee, and Reverend McFuel beamed with satisfaction. The fire crackled merrily. A few whitened Negroes in the crowd wished to assist the distressed men, but they feared for their own lives since they were assumed to be white. Shiloh writes, even so, they were looked at rather sharply by some of the Christ lovers because they did not appear to be enjoying the spectacle as thoroughly as the rest. Noticing these questioning glances, the white Negroes began to yell and prod the burning bodies with sticks and cast stones at them. This exhibition restored them to favor and banished any suspicion that they might not be 100% Americans. The double standard of justice perpetuated in Southern courts has inspired any number of caustic jokes, the most absurd of which find parallels in the annals of some Southern tribunals. A representative tale about the double standard of, ju of uh, justice uh, is this one which I collected in Richmond. A white guy and a black guy were in court for rape, and the man had sentenced both of them to hang. So the morning of the, white, of the hanging, the white guy was crying, <laughs> they're going to kill us, they're going to hang us, you know, they're going to hang us. The black guy said, man, why don't you shut up that noise? Man, you raped the woman and beat her. We did all these things, and the only thing we're getting is our just due. The white guy turned around, he said, you can talk, y'all used to it. <laughs> Several jokes are motivated by the fact that a white man's word was always accepted over a Negro's in most Southern courts, that is, after a Negro's word was allowed in court at all. One Negro facing trial was told by the judge that he was appointing two lawyers to represent him, and the judge asked if that were all right with him. The Negro replied, Your Honor, I thank you, but if you don't mind, I'd like to trade off one of those lawyers for one white witness. Another scathing comment on Southern justice was given to me by an informant who heard it in Louisville, Kentucky. A Negro was pulled from a river in Mississippi. He had five stab wounds and two gunshot wounds in his head and chest. In addition, his feet had been set in concrete and his hands were tied. The sheriff called a local civil rights leader and told him it was the worst case of suicide he'd ever seen. <laughs> From slavery through the present century, Southern Negroes have tended to equate the North, to regard the North as an Eden, 
a heaven to which they aspire to escape from the South, which they equate with hell. Though many discover that the North is indeed no paradise, the South remains associated with hell and thus bears the brunt of many tales like the following one which I collected in Charles City, Virginia. This man had lived in Mississippi, and they were getting along so poorly during that particular time that he went up north, like a lot of people who migrated to the north, to get out of the deep south because they were being treated so badly. So he went up north and he was getting along, getting along fine. Oh, he got on top. So some of his friends asked him to come back down to Mississippi and help the others. And so then he said, well, I'm going to talk to the Lord about it. So he talked to the Lord about it. And his friend asked him, say, well, what did the Lord tell you? So he said, I told the Lord my friends in Mississippi needed my help and asked him if he would go back south with me. And the Lord said, I'll go as far as Memphis. <laughs> Indeed, the South is so bad that according to Langston Hughes is simple, the baby of a white mother and a Negro father simply refused to be born in the South. <laughs> After several months had passed, the mother went to the doctor, who put his earphones to the mother's stomach and heard, I won't be born down here. No, sir, I won't be born down here. If you want to know what it's all about, as long as South is South, I won't come out. I won't be born down here. Semple insists that he wouldn't exchange all of the southern Jim Crow states put together for one bar stool in New York. Sterling Brown's slim Greer is sent to hell by St. Peter. Upon arriving, he sees people gambling, preachers with girls on their knees, and white devils throwing black devils into a furnace. Then the devil turns into a cracker with a sheriff's star. Then he realizes that he is in Dixie, and St. Peter comments, where in the hell did you think hell was anyhow? <laughs> Given his position in American society where he's always at the bottom, it is no surprise that some of the most popular comic tales in the black repertoire deal with the Negro in contest with his enemy and outsmarting him, outfighting him, and outperforming him sexually. During slavery, the most popular humorous tales dealt with Br'er Rabbit in conflict with the larger animals, and the slave John in conflict with the master. The animal tales range from those narratives in which Br'er Rabbit, who obviously represents the slave, wins the lady of his choice in competition with stronger animals or wins the preferred food, to those in which he causes the stronger animals physical discomfort or even in many instances destroys them. The jokes concerning the slave John have a similar range most frequently dealing with outsmarting old Massa, stealing from him, humiliating him, and sometimes achieving a physical victory over him. A favorite topic for humor among the slaves and later among domestic workers was either stealing from old Massa or the boss or fooling him out of some food. In his slave, narratives, in his slave narrative, William Wells Brown lightheartedly recalls a daily activity in the plantation home which afforded him an opportunity to take advantage of his master. Brown was the first black uh, slave novelist, incidentally, American. My master had family worship night and morning. At night, the slaves were called in to attend, but in the mornings, they had to be at their work, and master did all the praying. My master and mistress were great lovers of mint julep. And every morning, a pitcherful was made, of which they all partook freely, not excepting little Master William. After drinking freely all round, they would have family worship and then breakfast. I cannot say, but I loved the julep as well as any of them. And during prayer, was always careful to seat myself close to the table where it stood, so as to help myself when they were all busily engaged in their devotions. By the time prayer was over, I was about as happy as any of them. <laughs> One type of tale prevalent in Negro folklore involves the humiliation of the white man. Quite often, these tales involve a black who, after being frightened into submission, turns the table on his white persecutor, such as this one. These white guys, you know, got this black guy down in Mississippi somewhere, and they just started shooting around his feet, you know, say, dance, nigga, dance. And they were shooting, and he was jumping. The guy was scared. So when they got through, he said, you use all your bullets? They said, yeah. 
He pulled out that blade. He said, did you ever kiss a mule? The white guy said, no, but I always had an inkling. <laughs> <coughs> Particularly popular in these types of tales are those in which the black man indirectly calls a white man a name. In the slave tales, he usually calls old Massa indirectly, uh, calls him jackass. Here's the most widespread of the latter day variants of that kind of tale. This Negro was in court. He was down there for beating up a man. Judge asked him, what did he beat the man up for? He said, because he called me a black SOB. How would you like it if he called you a black SOB? The judge said, well, I'm not black. He said, I know that judge, but how would you like it if he called you the kind of SOB you is? <laughs> <coughs> Many tales in the black repertoire involve causing old massa some mild discomfort or occasionally inflicting a beating. One of the few highly comic scenes in Frederick Douglass's slave narrative is the account of the fight that Douglass had with Covey, to whom his master had hired him out. After a beaten, bleeding, bleeding Douglass vainly reports Covey's cruel treatment to his master, Covey again attacks the slave who this time fights back energetically, though at first he carries on a purely defensive battle, not delivering blows. Douglas relates, I flung him on the ground several times when he meant to have hurled me there. I held him so firmly by the throat that his blood followed my nails. He held me and I held him. All was fair thus far and the contest was about equal. My resistance was entirely unexpected and Covey was taken all aback by it for he trembled in every limb. Are you going to resist you scoundrel, said he, to which I returned a polite, yes sir. <laughs> when Covey attempts to get a stick, Douglas pulls him down on the, quote, not over, not over clean ground, for we were now in the cow yard, Douglas continues. He had selected the place for the fight, and it was but right that he should have all the advantages of his own selection. <laughs> Several of these tales derive their humor from the killing of old Massa or Mr. Charlie. The humorous slave expression, can't fool old Nat, suggests something of the delight that blacks took in a man who after killing several whites eluded a thousand more for six weeks. In a lengthy tale recounted in Zora Neale Hurston's Mules and Men, John fools old Massa into killing his horse, then his grandmother, and finally into getting into a weighted bag and letting John throw him into the river. Jokes dealing with killing become even more prevalent in the 60s. Dick Gregory tells of the Ku Klux Klansman whose sheet was on fire. We threw water at him, but we missed. So we went back and filled our buckets with gasoline. <laughs> Even when the slave could not contribute to his master's death, he gleefully rejoiced in it. The death of the master, oddly enough, furnishes some of the most humorous passages in the slave narratives. Lewis Clark, when asked if slaves don't say they love their masters, noted that when the master was sick, one or two slaves were sent up to his sick bed. They creep up to the bed and with a very soft voice inquire, how is dear Massa? Oh Massa, how we want to hear your voice out in the field again. Well, this is what they say up in the sick room. They come down to their anxious companions. How's the old man? Will he die? Yeah, yeah, he's sure to go this time. He never whipped the slave no more. Are you sure? Will he die? Oh, yes, surely going for it now. Then they all look glad and go to the cabin with a merry heart. Clark also relates several grimly humorous tales illustrating the slave's attitude towards the master's death. He tells of Jess and Bibb two slaves who dig an unusually deep grave for their dead master. When it was suggested that they fill it up some, Jess said it suited him, it, it suited him exactly. Bib said he wanted to get the old man as close home as possible. <laughs> William Wells Brown uses a humorous reversal in his comment on his master's illness, having received the news while in jail for attempting to escape. He writes, I had been in jail but a short time when I heard that my master was sick and nothing brought more joy to my heart than that intelligence. I prayed fervently for him, not for his recovery, but for his death. William Grimes uh, sardonically declares of his mistress, 
Young as I was then, I can yet remember her cruelty with emotions of indignation that almost drove me to curses. She is dead, thank God, and if I ever meet her again, I hope I shall know her. John Brown contemptuously relates his master's illness and death. Not long after this, Stevens was struck with paralysis. He lost the use of one side and of his speech. I was called in to watch and tend him, but I did not think it my duty to understand all he tried to say. This made him very savage. When the people learned he was not likely to recover, they were very much pleased and used to be very merry at quarters, for they knew they could not have a worse master. At least, he, I'm sorry, at last he died, and very glad we all were. I know I was. And even now, at this distance of time, when my troubles are over, I cannot help feeling that the world was well rid of him. I only hope he did not go where there is any chance of my meeting with him again. He was buried anyhow, nobody regretting him, not even his old dog who wagged his tail when the coffin went by his kennel. <laughs> this theme of delight in the master's death is echoed in the first black novel, Clotel, when the slave Sam and his fellow slaves sing, hang up the shovel and the hoe, take down the fiddle and the bow, Old master has gone to the slaveholder's rest. He has gone where they all ought to go. I heard the old doctor say the other night as he passed by the dining room door, perhaps the old man may live through the night, but I think he will die about four. Young mistress sent me at the peril of my life for the parson to come down and pray. For says she, your old master is now about to die. And says I, God speed him on his way. Very often in his humorous tales, the Negro is in conflict with Peter, God, or the devil, who frequently is just another big white boss such as they have suffered under in America. This association is often reaffirmed, incidentally, in many tales where mass opposes as God. And in these tales, heaven is all too often a duplication of the America that they have left behind. At times, it even reproduces the same system of segregation found in America as suggested in one prevalent tale in which a person visits heaven and returns to earth to relate the wonders to be found there. And when this person who happens to be white is asked about blacks, he replies that he didn't see any because he didn't visit the kitchens. In many of these tales, the black in one way or another revolts. He may lose in the end, but as in a large number of the other types of black tales, he takes pleasure in the rebellion itself. The black man may be put out of heaven, but at least they turn the, he turns the table over, as in this very popular old tale, which has been used thematically in works by Richard Wright and Ralph Ellison. This guy died and went to heaven, and he was so glad to get to heaven. St. Peter was giving out the wings, and he was so happy because he had made it, he decided he would get his wings himself. So he picked up two wings, didn't care which two, whether they were right or wrong, but it was two left wings. And he put them on, he was flying all one-sided, all around the walls, knocking down things. And St. Peter said, hey, say, come here. He said, who gave you those wings? He said, I put them on myself. He said, now look, you niggas done tore up earth. You're not coming up here and tear up heaven. Just give me those wings. <laughs> and the Negro said, well, I had a flying good time while I had them on, though. <laughs> and they waited until midnight. Finally, they heard a rumbling, and the Jew was shoving a mountain. So the Lord in his patience blessed the stones and said, these stones I will turn into bread. Well, the black man had a biscuit, the Italian had a wheelbarrow filled with loaves of bread, and the Jew had a bakery, of course. <laughs> so the next day, the Lord said, same gentleman, same assignment go out and fetch stones. Well, the black man was extremely happy for a second chance. So sometime later that evening, the Italian was the first one back with his same wheelbarrow filled with stones. And the Jew took very long to come, but here he is with his mountain. And they waited until midnight. The black man didn't show. 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. 
Well, just about dawn, they heard a rumbling sound and a whole avalanche of mountains and boulders, just everything was being hurled at the Lord. And finally, the Lord said, upon these rocks, I'll build my church. And the black man said, I be damned if you will, you gonna make bread today. <laughs> In this tale, like all of the tales of this type, any choice that the black man makes is wrong. He loses if he comes first. He loses if he comes last. He loses if he makes one choice. He loses if he makes the opposite choice. The only constant in the illogical situations under which the black functions in these tales is that he must lose. The blacks may be told that they are being punished for particular shortcomings, but the fact remains that they must suffer because of only one thing, their race. No matter what the black man does in these tales, the Lord, who represents the American economic system in the tale I just cited, will inevitably modify the rules. So whatever that Negro does, he is never going to get more than a biscuit. So I think these tales really say more about God, in quotation marks, and the economic system in America than about the black uh, victim. The absurd situations in which the black man finds himself in this country can produce absurd reactions on his part, too. Another more recent type of joke deals with the overly sensitive Negro who associates everything with the racial issue and the resulting overreaction. In one of the earlier variants of this type, Sterling Brown relates the story of a white man who tells his Negro friend his troubles, and the white man tells him about the fact that his house burned down and he didn't have any insurance. His wife ran away and left him and took the new car which he had just started to pay for. He's got a very serious illness and he has to go into the ho hospital for an operation. And the Negro looks at him unsympathetically and says, what you kicking about, you white, ain't you? <laughs> Another humorous tale concerns a young college graduate, graduate who was asked why he was turned down when he applied for a job as a radio announcer. So this is the same old thing, he says, pure prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> the humor that has developed as the black man views his ludicrous situation in this country is inexhaustible. It's obviously a humor based on things that the black man wishes weren't funny. For unfortunately, as Richard Wright has one of his characters in Law Today comment, well, it might sound like a joke, but God knows it's almost the truth. The second distinctive aspect of black American humor is its style, about which I'll make only a few brief comments. First of all, it is full of drama. A teller of tales rarely merely relates a tale. He acts it out. And for those who have observed a master black raconteur in action, that is an exciting, memorable occasion. Numerous collectors, such as Dawson, Richard Dawson, have attempted to describe such a scene, but the drama cannot be captured on the page. Further, the storyteller embellishes it with the drama of his language, which is highly picturesque and full of rich, of rich metaphor and simile. Um, the vocabulary is made interesting by the use of Negro slang expressions, jive talk, biblical expressions, stock phrases, a great many obscenities, and an unmatched love of the double entendre. I'm pretty square, so many examples I give you are probably long since outdated, but blacks are continually creating new words that add interest and humor to their tales, such as bodacious and bamboozle, all of those are at least 30 years old. Uh, then ordinary words take on new meanings, such as bad, down, blow, lay, rag, etc. And it's very interesting, and I think informative to note, that frequently negative words take on a positive meaning as they are readopted in uh, the black folk speech. The language is very active, so that verbs often predominate and also combine with other words, particularly nouns, to add activity uh, to statements. So that instead of chair, we have sitting chair, and instead of pot, cooking pot, and chop ax, etc. Nouns and adjectives may be used as verbs. He is uglying away. I wouldn't friend with him. Now, as Clyde Taylor notes, verbs are frequently combined with prepositions in jive talk. 
get over, get down, get on off into, and so forth. Double descriptions often add emphasis. Low down, kill dead, more great, more better, etc. Proverbial expressions take on a peculiarly black characteristic, as in Langston Hughes's samples, there is many a slop twixt the lip and the chop. You are likely to get gravy on your chin before you get the pork chop in. <laughs> Much of the humor is characterized by a musical rhythmical quality, a love of verbal play, and a delight in rhyme and pure sound. Note, for example, Peter Wheatstraw's response to the narrators, You Take It Easy, in Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. And as I read this, you will note that the person who is talking is a little bit disturbed because the person to whom he is talking is unable to respond, but that person's forgotten how to respond. Uh, the narrator is getting ready to leave. He says, you take it easy. Oh, I'll do that. All it takes to get along in this here man's town is a little shit, grit, and mother wit. And man, I was born with all three. In fact, I'm a seventh son of a seventh son, born with a call over my eyes and raised on black cat bones, high John the Conqueror, and greasy greens. You dig me, daddy? OK, I'm slowing down. I'll verse you, but I won't curse you. My name is Peter Wheatstraw. I'm the devil's only son-in-law, so roll him. You're a southern boy, ain't you? Well, get with it. My name's Blue, and I'm coming at you with a pitchfork. Fee, fi, fo, fum. Who wants to shoot the devil one? Lord God, Stinger Rate, you digging me? Who wants to shoot the devil one? Daddy, look me up sometimes. I'm a piano pa player and a rounder, a whiskey drinker, and a pavement pounder. I'll teach you some good bad habits. You'll need them. Good luck. Now, the, the narrator wasn't able to respond to him. Had it been Langston Hughes' simple, he would have known how to rap with Peter Wheatstraw, for he too enjoys experimenting with sounds and speech rhythms. Reflecting, and this is simple, that if Adam and Eve had been black, the world would not be in the fix it is in today, because a black Eve would not have paid attention to the serpent, he says. I never did know a Negro yet that liked a snake. He goes on to note that if a snake were to come to him and offer him an apple, he would say, Farmer, be on your way. No fruit today. Bud, you got the wrong stud now, so get along somehow. Be off down the road because you're lower than a toad. Seeing a pretty girl, Semple exclaims, Miss, your mama must have been sweet 16 when she boned you. 16 divided by 2. You come out of figure 8. Can I have a date? Hey, Lordy, Miss Claudia, you must be deaf. You done left. I'm standing here by myself. Um, <laughs> this use of rhyme finds expression in two distinct forms which have no precise parallels among, other, among folk groups of other races, the toast and the dozens. The toast, the long narrative poems, generally recounting the deeds of bad dudes, are a bit too obscene to recite completely here. However, the opening of the toast, which I collected and titled The History of the Dog, will give you some idea of the form and of the setting and characters and theme in, themes in many of the toasts. So I'll read the first few lines. Some of you guys may be surprised at what I'm about to say, but show me the lame who thinks he knows the game, and where did he learn to play? Now, the rules of the game is never teach a lame the game unless you make him pay. So let me tell just how I fell and what tricks fate played on me. So gather around while I run it down and unreal my history. Now it was a Saturday night and the jungle was bright and all the hustlers began stalking their prey, where the coal was crying that laid on the line and the weakest was doomed to pay, where blood was shed for the sake of bread and most drunks are beat for their poke. By the sight of the hands are the Murphy man and the words the con man spoke where most winos cringe to a canhead binge and make their graves in the snow, where girls of vice sell love for a hell of a price and most laws are corrupt. As I keep on going down trying, I keep crying, I say, now Jack, this is a bitter cup. At the grand display lit up like a Christmas toy, I was making my play for this female prey ever since I was just a boy. Now I was young and prancy and reefers was my fancy and knowed as an adequate male, but I cursed the day when I made my play at this sidewalking jazzy bell. Well, it gets a little more I've seen as it goes into their relationship. <laughs> um, so we'll go on to the dozens, and I'll just say, uh, the dozens, in case you're not familiar with, with them, are exchanges of insults sometimes rhyming, in which the most common goal is to put down the opponent's mother. Most of these are also very obscene. And the only examples that I could uh, find to read to you are a couple from Roger Abrahams uh, playing 
um, in an essay in Mother Wit from the Laughing Barrel. Fee fi fo from your mother's a bum. I can tell by your toes your mother wears brogues. I can tell by your knees your mother climbs trees. These are not exactly representative. <laughs> uh, much of the humor in many tales derives from the facility and delight with which the sounds of animals are produced. Others reflect aspects of the Negro's oral tradition, which stems from slavery. They are highly colored by the influences of the fervent religious services with the chants and shouts of the minister and the impassioned responses of the congregation and later on, of course, by the rhythms and stock phrases of the blues. This brief look at Afro-American humor suggests, I hope, that while indeed I cannot claim great originality and great uniqueness for our tradition of humor, as indeed no group can, I can claim that there is indeed much in the tradition that is highly creative and distinctive. Even where material has been borrowed directly from other cultures, and I'm sure some of you recognize some of the tales as variants of tales that you've known from other groups, even then the black American has modified it, reinterpreted it, and presented it in such a way that it becomes peculiarly his own. Indeed, many black literary humorists, comedians, players of the dozens, and toast tellers evince a certain approach to humor that in theme, technique, language, attitude, and style may be called distinctively Afro-American. Thank you.